Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Dropping stuff all over the place here. Well, today we're actually going to start a new study, as you might have guessed, and that is going to be on the book of Titus. Now, traditionally, uh, this book has been identified as a, if you will, a pastoral epistle. Um, and actually, it's part of a trilogy. Uh, First Timothy, Second Timothy, and then Titus, the, the third book. These books collectively are considered to be the pastoral epistles. And the reason that is, is you're actually going to, we're not going to get into it today, but as we get deeper into the book of Titus, you'll appreciate why it bears that title, why this book bears a pastoral epistle title. Now, before we break into this book, I want to establish some groundwork and kind of get a feel for the environment or the backdrop. I don't know about you, but for me, uh, when I enter into study a book, I want to get my bearings. I want to understand my surroundings. I want to have this, if you will, mental landscape, a backdrop that I understand that's going on, the historical context and what have you, because it draws me in. And I'm going to tell you, when you get drawn into the story or you're getting drawn into a book, you are going to draw more out of it. Because of that. So where I'm going with this is we are going to be asking the questions today. Who, what, when, where, and why? In other words, who wrote this epistle? Well, we know this. There's no question about it. This is not something that's debated at all. The authorship belongs to the apostle Paul. He's the author of it. We see this right away at the, at the head of the document itself. And then we ask the question, to whom was it written? Well, we actually, it was written to a Gentile. And this is going to become more pertinent as we get deeper into this uh, study. But it was written to a Gentile named Titus. Now, the thing that's less certain about this is when it was written. Now, the, this, this, the experts, they estimate between 62 and 65 AD. Between these years, it's estimated that this epistle is written. I'm going to tell you for me, that stops you in your tracks. When you know that this epistle was written at this time, you need to understand something. There's a lot going on in history at this moment. You know, the 60s are getting crazy. They're getting intense. And I'm not talking about the 1960s, (laughs) which would apply. (laughs) But the 60s in the first century were really crazy. It was getting intense. You think about some things that are happening. 62, Pompeii was devastated by a massive earthquake. Still talked about today. Okay, so you think about these things. Remember what Yeshua said in Matthew 24? Behold, there will be earthquakes in various places. And keep in mind, when he said that, and as we're into the 60s, and the apostles are going forth with the gospel, they believe they are in the last days. And so they're experiencing things the, it appears that the world's coming to an end. Go back to Matthew 24. And also, Yeshua says something else in there that is profound that ties in here. That the gospel is to go out to all nations and then the end will come. What is happening in the 60s? The gospel is going out to all the nations. And so, very, very intense time. Let me build upon that. Nero, emperor of Rome. This is his timetable. This is when Nero is ruling Rome. Why does that matter? What's that have to do with our study? It has a lot to do with this study. Did you know that in 64 AD, it fits right in this timetable, there's a great fire in Rome. The ironic thing about it was, is that Nero, it was suspected that he was to blame for this great fire. Well, what did Nero do? He put the blame on the Christians. And I want you to understand something. This timetable, under Emperor Nero, this is when the great persecution arose against Christianity. This is when it rose. And let me be very clear. Who made up the majority of Christianity? Messianic Jews. Okay? This is when the great persecution arose. And it lasted for hundreds of years. It's not until Constantine where there is relief. And so this is an epic time in history, right when this epistle is being written. I want to dig into this a little bit before we go forward here. I want to take you to Tacitus. 
And if any of you are not familiar with Tacitus, Tacitus is a Roman historian. He's one of the most prolific Roman historians ever. He is not a Christian. He is not tied in any way to the faith. He is complete pagan. He is a Roman. Okay? And he's a historian. Amazing thing is, is he left us a lot of history. I want to share some of it with you, which corroborates exactly what I'm telling you. This is what he says. But all human efforts, all the lavish gifts of the emperor, and meaning Nero, and the propitiations of the gods, he's talking about the Romans' gods, did not banish the sinister belief that the conflagration, meaning the fire, this is the fire we're talking about in AD 64, was the result of an order. And so here, Tacitus is saying is that we, we, are, we, we believe this is the word on the street is that Nero's responsible. He gave the order to burn Rome. Has that ever happened before? <clears throat> Hitler? Okay. Consequently, to get rid of the report, Nero fastened the guilt and inflicted the most exquisite tortures on a class hated for their abominations. Who are they? They're called Christians by the populace. I want you to understand something. This is amazing. These Christians that they're classifying, he mentions Tacitus. This is a secular account. This has nothing to do with scripture, not tied to faith. Totally secular. And he identifies Christians. Real life Christians in a total secular account. This is amazing. But not just that. He says they're hated for what? They're abominations. What is he referring to? He's referring to the fact that the Christians were holding fast to something known as the kingdom of God and that there is another king other than Caesar, other than Nero. And that is abomination to the Romans. And so we start to see this unfold here. And it's amazing that this is getting put. It's being inflicted upon them. We continue on. Christ, uh, Christus or Christos in the Greek, I mean, this is how you would pronounce it in the Greek, it's referring to Yeshua. Are you sitting down? Do you understand that we are reading a secular document that is confirming the existence of our Messiah? Amen. It's powerful. It corroborates everything that we've read in the New Testament that we believe, and people try to tell us it's a lie. Well, this is secular history. This guy has no ties to Yeshua whatsoever, to Christ. And here he comes out, Christos, from whom the name had its origin. In other words, what's the name had its origin? He's talking about where Christians, the name Christians had its origin is from Christ. That's where they got it. All right? Suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of one of our procurators, Pontius Pilatus. Pontius Pilate. Secular documentation of the crucifixion of Yeshua. It's right here. The Pontius Pilate. And a most mischievous superstition, obviously referring to the fact that he's proclaiming to be someone great and be the king of some kingdom, thus checked for the moment, again broke out not only in Judea, the first uh, source of the evil, but even in Rome. Now, do you understand what he just said? When Pilate killed him, this Christianity seemed to quelch. It seems to die out. But then all of a sudden, he says it was for a moment, but then all of a sudden there's an explosion of the faith. The faith went out again. And he said it's even reached Rome. Well, now why would that be? Because of the resurrection, the gospel. The very reason we're here today is because the gospel issue that he rose from the dead. Powerful. As we're seeing this, and this is just coming from secular eyes as he sees it. Where all things, and he's referring to Rome, hideous and shameful from every part of the world, find their center and become popular. I agree with that. Moving on. Accordingly, an arrest was first made of all who pleaded guilty. Then upon their information, an immense multitude was convicted. Not so much of the crime of firing the city as of hatred against mankind. Think about what was just said here. You better learn your history. Because if you're reading this appropriately, you'll realize that, oh my goodness, we are living this today 
literally right now. He is saying that the Christians that immediately were getting blamed for this fire, it wasn't about the fire. We weren't putting blame on them. We hate them because they're haters of mankind. Does this sound familiar? That when I don't go along with the agenda that says, unless I tell a woman she can kill innocent children because she has the right, if I don't go along with that agenda, I'm a hater. I'm a racist. I'm a bigot because I don't go along with that agenda because I care about innocent children. Isn't that interesting? This is exactly what Rome did to the Christians. If I don't go along with gay marriage, I'm a hater. You don't go along with the system, the status quo. You're a hater against mankind. This is nothing new. What we are seeing in this country right now is nothing new. It happened to the Messianic believers in the first century. And what does it tell you? I've said this before and I say it again. We are in the brink of persecution. And if you are not solid in your faith, you are not going to make it. You will compromise. Unless you are confronted with this reality and you have reserved yourself that you're going to die for the kingdom, you're going to pick up your cross and you're going to follow Yeshua, you're going to fall very soon. This is reality. We continue on. Mockery of every sort was added to their deaths, covered with the skins of beasts. They were torn by dogs and perished or were nailed to crosses or were doomed to the flames and burnt to serve as a nightly illumination when daylight has expired. I hope you understand. So the way Rome decided to light up the night so that they could see was burning Christians alive. This is how they did it. So this backdrop, what's happening here? Yes, this is critically important when we go into the book of Titus, which was written right at this time because it tells you something what does it tell you satan went out he was enraged against the woman against the believers in yeshua because the gospel was going to the four corners of the earth and he was livid his kingdom was under attack you go bring the gospel of yeshua out you're destroying the kingdom of satan total all-out war total all-out war This is intense. And so Paul knows Satan is on the move. He is on the heels of the gospel. And he's coming to destroy it. He knows this. Moving on to ask the question, where was this letter written? We don't know where Paul was at this point, at least with the documents we have today. We have no idea where Paul was when he wrote it, but we know where it went, where he sent it. And that was to the island of Crete. Now, an interesting thing about Crete is we definitely know that there was a semblance, at least even even if it's minimal, a presence of the faith there, uh, even before this letter to Titus was written. Now, why do I say that? Because when you go to Acts chapter 2, we read about the Shavuot event, right? And the Ruach HaKodesh comes down, and there's men from every nation there. There's Jews from every nation under heaven, and they hear the wonderful works of God from their own land, from where they're residing. Go back and read the event, and you will read that the, some of the men were there were called Cretans. They were from Crete. And so you think about the 3,000 that were added. Now, we have no idea how many from Crete actually, except the Messiah, were baptized, but you safely assume there were definitely some, and they went back home, And they brought the faith with them. And so this is just a look at this as we can see a little bit of history behind Crete. And this is where it was written. But now we get to the point of what is it about and why is it written? When I take you through the history and show you exactly this persecution arising, going out, well, you know exactly why it's written. It's written to strengthen the churches, to establish these churches. You're going to find out that The churches in Crete, they're fragmented, okay? These churches are fragmented, they're unstructured, and therefore they're spiritually exposed. And Paul is, he's fearful for this, and he wants them strong, he knows the attacks of the enemy, and he knows that they're under attack. So he's he's literally sending this epistle to Titus, set these things in order, Titus, get us strong, get them where they need to be we need to have order we need to have structure so that we can withstand the wiles of the devil 
So that pretty much sums up the who, the what, the when, the where, the why. With that out of the way, I want to get into this epistle. We're going to go to chapter 1, verse 1, and this is what we read. Paul, a bondservant of God and an apostle of Yeshua Mashiach. Pretty traditional introduction for Paul. And this is how, go read, all, read through his epistles. Just go to the first verse or two, and you will find this is how he wants to introduce himself. Now, why does that matter? Well, you need to take special note of this because there's a specific way, there's a specific identity that Paul relates to, that Paul always wants to make sure that his audience is aware of. And you think, you know, think about, he could have started it any other way. He could have said, you know what, I'm Paul of Tarsus. Why not start that way? I mean, that's a good introduction. It's accurate, right? Or why not start with this? Paul. A Hebrew of the Hebrews, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee. This is, I mean, what an amazing introduction. Think about this. Paul is revered among his own people, among the Jewish people. For these reasons, he is highly decorated. He is revered. It's credibility. It would make sense that he would introduce himself in all his epistles this way, but he doesn't. It's not how he introduces. He introduces himself as a bondservant of Elohim, a servant of Yeshua. I got I to gotta tell you something. When, you know, this is many years back. One of the things that I did that really drew my attention, and one of the things that I wanted to seek out, how does Paul introduce himself? And I went to all his epistles. I laid them all out, and I put all these introductions side by side, just studied them, poured over them, because to me, it tells me a lot about somebody as, as to how they introduce themselves. I learned a lot about the Apostle Paul, of how he values, what he values in his identity, how he identifies himself. I'm going to tell you something. The Apostle Paul has ministered to me personally, to my heart, in a very, very powerful way, just by his introductions, because he told me he is established, that his identity is established in Christ, in Mashiach. And that has spoke volumes to me, that we don't regard the acts of the flesh, the things that we've been given according to the flesh, which if, if that were the case, Paul would boast better than all of us. Because of who he was in the flesh, which was awesome, and yet his identity, he clung to his identity in Yeshua. And you know what that has done? Because he has done that, he has taught me that my identity is in Yeshua, period. That's where the power is. He could not employ a greater, more powerful introduction than what he just did and what he does in all his epistles. Now, there's something else worth mentioning here about this introduction and it really adds some flair drama, if you will. And that is the fact that Paul is weaving the father, if you will, together with the son. This, this beautiful unified tapestry where the father and Yeshua are a chad. And Paul's allegiance is to them. I'm going to say that again. Paul's allegiance is to them. You remember those words that Yeshua spoke in Matthew? A man cannot serve two masters. Cannot do it. Go through all of Paul's epistles and read, and they all read similar to this. All of them. Where you have the father being mentioned, that he is a bondservant of God and of Yeshua. I mean, this is really, really powerful. You know, if you're considering and have issues with the deity of Yeshua, you need to go through Paul's salutations in all his epistles. Because what you're going to discover is that he is very, very careful to present Yeshua as one with the Father, where Yeshua is receiving the same glory and honor that the Father receives. In fact, at times, let me take this a step further, what you're going to find is the Apostle Paul, he transposes specific terms that he applies to Hashem, and he applies those terms to Yeshua. And let me show you. Looking at Titus 1.1, 1, 1, we read, Paul, a bondservant of God. Okay? Now you go to Philippians, he says this. Paul and Timothy, bondservants of Yeshua HaMashiach. 
Titus, he's a bondservant of Hashem. Philippians 1.1, he's a bondservant to Yeshua HaMashiach. A man cannot serve two masters. He's talking about a status, a bondservant. He is a servant. A servant has a master. All throughout this, we find what? They are echad. They are one. This is a powerful concept. In fact, let me take it a step further. If you look at all of Paul's prologues throughout his epistles, he consistently hammers a particular theme home again and again, and that is this. And I would have put them all up here. I just I couldn't fit anymore. I just put what I could fit on there. Look at the words on the screen. They're virtually identical. He says these things in all these various epistles. Grace to you, peace from God our Father, and the Lord Yeshua HaMashiach. Peace and grace come through Hashem, through Elohim. And then he says, and through the Lord Yeshua HaMashiach. You, are, are we picking up on what he is doing here? I mean, this is powerful. This is a massive revelation. You get into this that we know creation is the father working through his son. We know redemption, grace, and peace being brought to the world was the father through the son. And we know judgment is coming. And that will be from the father through the son. I mean, this is powerful. These prologues, these make it to the head of all these documents that we have in our New Testament. It's a powerful, powerful message. With that said, I want to take you back to Titus 1.1, and we're going to continue on. It says, Paul, a bondservant of God and an apostle of Yeshua HaMashiach. We're not done with verse 1. Now he goes on to say this, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledgement of the Truth, which accords with godliness. Now you step back for a moment and just look at this. What do you see? And for there's a particular class I'm teaching right now, and I am attempting to hammer home a very critical point in this class. And what is that? That is the structure of the faith. You step back and you see the structure of the faith Right in his introduction. Now I got to tell you. The structure of the faith works like this. Once your eyes are open to the concept. Once you understand it. You'll see it everywhere in scripture. It's unbelievable. It's kind of like. I always liken it to. When you buy a car. You never had before. You've never owned before. You buy that make and model. And you start driving around. Pretty soon. You recognize. Wow. There's a lot of people with the same car. I notice it everywhere. Right? Right? You had this massive revival. Well, all those cars were there before, but you never saw them. You never recognized them. It wasn't until the revelation, until it became real to you, until you started driving it and it, be, it became yours. Then you see clearly. Then you start recognizing it all over the place. The structure of the faith works exactly like that. It works exactly because once you have it, then it's everywhere. And... Well, let me say this. For those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, you haven't been with me long enough, um, and you really don't know what the structure of the faith is, this is simply a title that I am utilizing to describe or define faith. Biblical faith, all right? Let me take you to James, because James is going to describe this structure of the faith quite well. And uh, I, I want you to see this. In chapter 2, verse 14, What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? <laughs> He's talking about a conceptual faith here. One that only resides up here. There's a faith. There's, I, I, I can say in my mind, I believe. I believe this. And James is asking the question, well, can that conceptual faith save you? It's a rhetorical question. It cannot. It cannot save you. Now, let's continue because he's going to explain this. He's going to give us an example, uh, being an excellent teacher that he is. If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, depart in peace, be warm and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? If you don't have works, Righteous acts, if you're not loving your neighbor as yourself, your faith is worthless. 
This is what Yaakov is saying. This is what he's telling us. And then he goes to give this conclusion. This is what he says in the conclusion. Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, it is dead. It's not faith. And so here's where we get into this this title, the structure of the faith. What James just explained is the structure of the faith. Look at it this way. Faith is belief in Yeshua and works, righteous works, or obedience to God's commandments. That's what faith is. This is the structure of the faith. And you know what's interesting? Uh, Again, you know, I hammer this point home all the time. According to the Torah, according to Scripture, all things are established on the testimony of two or three. And you can see this woven throughout the tapestry of the universe. Yeshua sent out his disciples two by two. It was not a coincidence. The gospel was being established, right? You think about our sky and the earth and how it's governed. It's governed by two lights, a greater light and a lesser light, the sun and the moon, right? And our day, one day, consists of the testimony of two, the evening and and the morning are the first day. And we could go on. So it's a testimony to testimony to. You think about life. You cannot have life unless you bring a male and female, a, a, a husband and wife together. It's the testimony of two. And bam, life is created. All things are created on the testimony of two. Going back to this last point that I was making in this prologue, even God himself has chosen to establish himself on the testimony of two and three, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And just look at the evidence. The evidence tells you that when he created, he created it through Yeshua, right? When he redeemed his people, the Father did it through his Son and judgment. I mean, those are the three pinnacle moments, which is interesting because all things are established on the testimony of two or three. This age, this entire age can be broken up into three components. I mean, it's unbelievable. We could do this all day long. My point is that the faith itself is established on the testimony too. Everything is established on the testimony. The things that you can eat are established on the testimony too. If they're in the sea, they have to have fins and scales. Or if they're on land, they have to have cloven hooves and chew the cud. Everything is established on the testimony of two. Moving on, going back to James and, and getting into verse 18. But someone will say, well, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that there is one God. You do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. It's like, so he's, he's you know, my modern day interpretation. whoop de do. You believe. Go pat yourself on the back. Well, guess what? He just totally takes the wind out of my sails when he tells me even the demons believe. And what do I know about the demons? Why does he use demons? They've been condemned to death. There is no hope for these demons. They're literally products of iniquity. They're children of disobedience. You go and study the story. They are children of disobedience. this This is absolutely amazing. And so all the wind out of the sail, this conceptual idea that we can have belief in our mind, and that is the extent of faith, it doesn't work. Our end will be like that of the demons. And so faith is not a conceptual idea. It's a way of life. It's the choices you make, the things that you do. What does Yeshua say in, in Matthew 7? By their fruit, you will know them. Interesting. It's by their fruit. Their actions, the things that they do. Not just the things they say, but the things they go forth and do. I want to give you a real life example of the structure of the faith. And I think is really going to hit home. And it's in the life of Cain. Cain and Abel, that everyone I think is pretty familiar with that story. Well, in Genesis 4, 3, we read this. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. I want to be very clear. Cain doesn't have an issue with conceptual faith. Cain believes in the Lord. He believes that Elohim created his mother and father, Adam and Eve. There's no issue here. He so believes that he is the Lord, he has brought an offering. 
You don't bring an offering to someone you don't believe in. Cain's issue has nothing to do with belief in God. Think about this. Moving on to verse 4. Abel also brought the firstborn of his flock and their fat. Now I got to stop right here. Isn't that interesting? Because here we're seeing the eternal nature of Torah. Abel is bringing the firstborn of his flock. The eternal nature of Torah. Here we see the Torah long before it's ever revealed at Mount Sinai. See, one of the things that the Lord revealed, and as actually before Mount Sinai, as they're coming out of Egypt, the Lord revealed to Israel that you are to sanctify me all the firstborn. This is man and beast. They are mine. Okay? It pleased the Lord to have that sacrifice. He wanted the first one, the firstborn of the flock. Isn't that amazing that Abel is making that offering? That just proves, and there's so many other things we could look at, it proves the eternal nature of the Torah. The Torah is God's character, his ways, his likes and dislikes. And here Abel is fulfilling what pleases the Lord. That is a powerful concept. And what's it say? The Lord responds, and the Lord respected Abel in his offering. He respected it. He did what pleased the Lord. Not so much so for Cain. But he did not respect Cain in his offering. Now, it's always interesting. There's all sorts of ideas as to why the Lord didn't respect Cain in his offering. Uh, some would say that, well, he should have brought of his firstborn of his flock. That would have been a greater sacrifice. And I agree with that. There's a very real element there. We got to go deeper. If you go to Proverbs 15, Proverbs 15 actually tells us the sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord. The sacrifice of the wicked, the wicked can bring their offering, but it will not be respected. It will not be acknowledged. And that is the case that we have going on right now with Cain. He is wicked in his heart. He does not do the things that please the Lord. And just this whole scenario unfolding is evidence of this. And Cain, this is, now listen to how Cain responds. And Cain was very angry and his countenance fell so that the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry and why has your countenance fallen? And he goes on, if you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door. This gets into righteousness, walking out what pleases the Lord, doing the things that please him, doing the things that make him happy. If you do well, he doesn't say if you really think really hard in your mind that I exist, this is going to pan out just fine. You have to do well. You don't, you're cast off. And so this, this mantra today where the devil has come in and seduced the church, telling them it doesn't matter what they do. Their works don't save them, so works have nothing to do with salvation. You are deceived. Twelve ways from Sunday. Because everything in scripture that I go to tells me the exact opposite. And so here he says, you don't do well, sin lies at the door. It's, it's fascinating to me that Yeshua uses the exact same imagery here of being at the door. In Revelation, he goes, behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if anyone hears me, he will let me in. I will come in and dine with him and he with me. It's interesting. But if we don't do well and we don't hear Yeshua, who's at that door? Sin. And here's the interesting thing. As it continues, it says, and its desire is for you. We all know the, the Hebrew word teshuvah. It means to repent. The word used here is teshukah, desire. Teshukah. Sin is longing for you. Sin cries out for you. It needs you. It is attracted to you. It is coming for you. So you can guarantee it. It is coming for you. But I love this part. And this is what the Lord says. But you should rule over it. We are to rule. Mashal in the Hebrew literally means we are to govern. We are to have dominion. In fact, that's how it's translated at times. Dominion. 
You think about the Apostle Paul, and what does he say in, in Romans 6? Sin shall not have dominion over you. Goes right back to here, to Adam, uh, to Abel and Cain. Right back to here. Sin is not to have dominion over us. He goes on and says, for you are not under law, but under grace. And then going into 15, he, he says, what then? Shall we continue in sin? That grace may abound? Certainly not. And he, he, it's like he knows this. He knows the human flesh. He knows the human nature that when I say that we're not under law, we're under grace, we're just going to take that to go out and sin. And so he adds verse 15, not allowing you to go to that place. So Cain, my point is a simple point. He's a perfect example of what James is talking about in regard to having faith, but not having righteous works to support that faith. And therefore his faith is in faith. Because faith without works is dead. Right? Amen? Looking at the story kind of puts a different whole light on what you think of works. Righteousness. Sacrifice. All of these things really puts it in perspective. Let me take you back to the book of James. There's one more thing I want to cover there. And actually I want to give James an opportunity to give his own example. I took you to Cain. And I would call this a negative example. Because Cain didn't do what's right, and he failed. I want to show you what James' example is, because he gives us a positive example. And frankly, he couldn't have picked a better example. And this is what he says in James 2.20. But do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham, our father, justified by works? Just stop and think about what he said This concept is anathema to the church. He was justified by works. That is part. Let me say this. If you get this concept, this concept of the structure of the faith, it is going to change the way you download the word of God. You know why I say that? Because I, I immediately these, I get these flood of thoughts in my head of all these different things. When we read the Apostle Paul, we enter treacherous waters. And I say treacherous waters because that's what Peter alludes to. That men who are untaught and unstable will twist to destruction as they do also the rest of the scriptures. You enter into the epistles of Paul, you enter into treacherous waters, and you don't survive those waters unless you understand the structure of the faith. Because there are times where Paul looks like he's explicitly saying the law is obliterated, it's completely gone, and there are other times that Paul's telling me, I'm to establish the law. But what do you do? That sounds crazy. And then the flesh makes the decision, well, I don't understand the dynamics of how these two can be, so I'll choose this one, the law is gone. And you think about how he talks about works, he's explicit. Works cannot save you. But then at other times, in Ephesians, he's telling me that I was designed for the express purpose of works, good works. See, that sounds crazy. He sounds insane unless you have this concept. Unless you have this concept of the structure of the faith where you understand what faith is. That faith without works is dead. See, if you mess with this structure in any way, Here's faith, here's works. If I attempt to jump into Judaism, Orthodox Judaism's camp, and I take away faith in Yeshua, I am just left with works. That is not faith. But let me jump on the other side of the tracks into Christianity. I got faith, but I take away righteousness and works. That is not faith. It's right down the middle. It's Messianic Judaism. It's calling upon the name of Yeshua and walking in his righteousness, fearing God and keeping his commandments, Ecclesiastes 12, 13. That's what it is. And so, James, Yaakov, sounds absolutely insane here. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac, his son, on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works? And by works, faith was made perfect. In other words, it's made complete. You complete it. You complete the thought. You know, when I think I want to go home from a long day, that's great. I can think about it all the time until I get in the car and go. That thought, that desire doesn't mean beans. Right? 
Continuing on in verse 23. And the scriptures, the scripture was fulfilled. I want to stop right there because, you know, sometimes we just blow by things that they're saying. But make no mistake, the apostles, like Yaakov, like Apostle Paul, they were ever so careful about conveying their ideas. He Stop right here. He says the scripture was fulfilled. What does he mean by that? Well, he's going to take us back to Genesis 15 right now and explain this and how this faith has been made perfect. Abraham, which says, he goes back to Genesis 15, Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. What is James talking about? Some of you are still lost. You're still not making the connection. I'm going to take it a step further. I'm going to lay this out simplistically so that we understand this. I'm going to take you back to Genesis 15. I want to show you. Then God, Elohim, brought Avraham outside and said, Look now toward heaven. Count the stars if you're able to number them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. And he believed in the Lord and he accounted it to him for righteousness. Now keep in mind, it's up here. His belief was in his mind. This is conceptual belief, okay? The, he walks outside and the Lord makes this declaration. I'm gonna make your descendants as the stars. He has them looking up. This is the imagery that he wants in Abraham's head. So Abraham looks up and in his heart, which the Lord knows, Abraham said, I believe him. I believe him. That's conceptual faith. That's beautiful. That isn't the end of the story. It didn't end there, and all of a sudden, poof, he confirmed it. Do you know that the Lord had not confirmed that promise yet? He did not confirm it here. He accounted it to Abraham for righteousness. That promise is not confirmed, not until we go to Genesis 22, which is what James picked up on in regard to the sacrifice of Isaac. The Lord told Abraham, go, you're going to sacrifice your son. Sounds crazy. I don't care who you are. That's insane. And there are times where you go to the word, you know, you look at it and say, that's that's just stupid. You know, Christians, they look at these things that even we do, that we start embracing these beautiful things in Torah. They think you're absolutely nuts. You're not going to eat bacon. That's crazy. That just sounds so off the wall. Well, think about Abraham. God commanded. End of story. Abraham didn't deliberate. He went up to sacrifice his son Isaac. And then what happens? Well, this is what we read in Genesis 22, 15. Then the angel of the Lord called to Avraham a second time out of heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your only son, blessing I will bless you and multiplying I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven and as the sand which is by the seashore and your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. It was only because it was confirmed. Abraham's faith was confirmed with obedience to God's word, literally to his voice. That's when he confirmed the promise. I mean, this is amazing. Jumping ahead to Genesis 26. This is the Lord speaking to Isaac. Listen to what he says. And I will make your descendants multiply as the stars of heaven. I will give your descendants all these lands and in your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because Abraham obeyed my voice, kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my Torah. That's why. I mean, he even says this in case you were unclear about it before. As you come to Genesis 26, it is established the reason the Lord established his covenant with Abraham. And he's going to bring it past because Abraham passed the test. He passed the test. Think about that. What happened to the children of Israel? They're in Egypt. They're under bond. They're in bondage to Pharaoh, who's representative of Hasatan, right? Do you know all these plagues start falling down from God? Pharaoh still doesn't, despite the hand of God, think about this, coming down in power, Pharaoh doesn't release them. It is not until the lamb's blood was shed. And then at the lamb's blood, when that is shed, what happens? They're released from bondage and they're sent out. That's the power of Yeshua. That's the blood of Yeshua setting us free from bondage. But is that the end of the story? Did they also go, oh, poop, we're in the promised land. It was like, we put the lamb's blood on the door. Next thing you know, I'm eating grapes and in my mansion. It doesn't happen like that. Follow the story. It's the structure of the faith. The whole Passover story is that lamb's blood was shed. 
And then he takes them out into a wilderness. They didn't go into the promised land. He takes them out into the middle of nowhere, allows them to hunger and thirst to test them to whether they would keep his commandments or not. You see what I'm saying? Confirm the faith. And guess what? The only people that went into the promised land held their ground. They held fast. They believed in the Lord. They kept his commandments. I want to move on. I want to give you just a few brief examples. We'll close today. I want to give you some examples of all over the place of the structure of the faith. And it speaks volumes. And this is, I, I, I want to inspire you. Because once you know what to look for, you say it's everywhere. And once you have this locked and loaded, you are going to be able to be an amazing light to believers. To help them understand this craziness where in one point, it sounds like Paul's crazy and saying the law is done away. With another point, it sounds like he's telling us to be obedient. This will help this. Jeremiah 17, 7. Blessed is the man who what? Trusts in the Lord. And his hope is in the Lord. I mean, this is who is blessed, those who believe, right? And then look at the promise that lies with it. For he shall be like a tree planted by the waters, which spreads out its roots by the river and will not fear when he comes, but its leaf will be green and will not be anxious in the year of drought, nor will cease from yielding fruit. Got it? You believe in the Lord, you're blessed. And you're going to be like a tree planted by the waters. Let me take it to Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his Torah, he meditates day and night. Okay, that's interesting. I go to Jeremiah. I'm told I'm blessed if I believe in the Lord. I trust in him. I go to Psalm 1, and I'm told I'm blessed if I keep the Torah. I walk in his way. I clothe myself with his word, with his Torah. Well, it's interesting, as you continue, look at the promise that is attached. Identical, right? He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. So if I ask Jeremiah, who's blessed, he tells me the one who believes. I go to Psalm, who is blessed, the one who keeps Torah. Structure of the faith. Going to John. This is the words of Yeshua. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life. Very simple. How do I obtain eternal life? I believe in Yeshua. Okay, let me take you to Matthew chapter 19. This is Yeshua, mind you. This isn't somebody else. Now behold, one came to him and said, Good teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? So he said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. But if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. That's crazy. Okay, so we talked to Yeshua in John 3. He says, well, you want to enter into life? You got to believe in me. I talked to him in Matthew 19. He tells me, you got to keep the commandments. Structure of the faith. It's just keeping, it comes together here. John 8. Therefore, I said to you that you will die in your sins. And this is in the negative context. If you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Okay, this is crystal clear. We're going to die in our sins if we don't believe in him. Let me take you to Ezekiel. But when a righteous man turns away from his righteousness and commits iniquity and does according to all the abominations that a wicked man does, shall he live? All the righteousness which he has done shall not be remembered because of the unfaithfulness of which he is guilty and the sin which he has committed because of them he shall die. (laughs) So if I commit unrighteousness, I walk away from the commandments of God. Ezekiel tells me, and it's the Lord speaking. This is the Lord speaking in Ezekiel. You're dead. Yet we go to John 8. If I don't believe in Yeshua, I'm dead. Structure of the faith comes together. Acts chapter 2, it's all together. Then Peter said to them, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Yeshua. Hamashiach for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. To receive that gift of the Holy Spirit, to receive eternal life, I need to repent. I need to turn from sin. How do I define sin? The Torah. I turn from sin, and what must I do? I must call upon the name of Yeshua. I must be baptized in him, structure of the faith. It's everywhere. John 7, he who believes in me, as scripture has said, out of his heart will flow the rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the spirit 
whom those believing in him would receive for the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Yeshua was not yet glorified. Do you get what he just said? You're going to get the Holy Spirit if you believe in him. It's real simple. You get this gift of the Holy Spirit. Well, let me take you to Acts 5.32. And we are his witnesses to these things. Uh, So also is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. Structure of the faith. See, they're not contradicting one another. It's simply the structure of the faith. Let me go to Revelation, and we're going to close after that. One of my favorite examples, I save this for the end, because this is in the same book. This is, this is pretty incredible. Then one of the elders answered and said to me, Who are these arrayed in white robes, and where did they come from? And I said to him, Sir, you know. And so he said to me, These are the ones who come out of the great tribulation, ah, and washed their robes and made them white. How? In the blood of Yeshua. The blood of the lamb. So here you have these men at the end. They are wearing white robes at the end. And we are told the reason they're wearing white robes is because of the blood of Yeshua. Let me take you just a few chapters ahead. Same book. Same author. And this is what we read. And to her, meaning to the, to, to the saints, it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Okay, so you go to Revelation 7. They're wearing these white robes, we're told, because they're washed in the blood of the Lamb. Then as you go to 19, I'm told they're wearing these white robes. And it's the righteous acts of the saints. It's what they are. It's the structure of the faith over and over again. Genesis to Revelation, the pages are filled with the structure. And understand how this works. Revelation 12, 17. And the dragon was enraged with the woman who went to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and they have the testimony of the Messiah Yeshua. Structure of the faith. This is who the dragon's enraged with. He's not really concerned about somebody who has this deep philosophical conceptual belief. He's not intimidated. He's not intimidated by all those who go out and just seek to keep the Torah and keep all those commandments and they will not call upon the Lamb. They will not call upon Yeshua. He's not intimidated at all. This is scary. Revelation 14, 12, we read, here is the patience of the saints, meaning perseverance. What is the perseverance of the saints? It describes it. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Yeshua. You want to know what Yeshua means when he says, he who endures to the end will be saved? It means you never renounce his great name and you never stop following his word. That's what it means. So, in closing, when we look at Titus 1.1, Paul, a bondservant of God, an apostle of Yeshua Mashiach, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledgement of the truth, which accords to godliness, there's a lot here. Paul's bringing out a special identity, powerful. He's exalting Yeshua and the Father as being a chad, and he's delivering the structure of the faith. Who knew there would be so much in one little verse? And that's all we're going to cover today. We got, got pretty far in the book today. One verse. It's, at this rate, it's going to take over a year to get through this book. I think we're going to speed it up. I want everyone to rise. We're going to do our battle cry. But it's going to be a little bit different today. I've changed the battle cry. And this is what's going to happen this year. I'm going to be implementing prayers that have spoken to my life. Prayers that I want you to learn. Prayers that I know you are going to need. Despite everybody thinking everything's all right in this country, uh, it's not. We're a long way away from that. So, but, okay, so I'm going to be implementing these prayers periodically throughout uh, this year. I'll be changing them up. But for today, we're going to be, and I'll probably keep this one for a couple weeks because I want you to learn it. Like you know the Shema. You guys, every one of you can go home and do the Shema. That's fantastic because you recite it every time. We need to learn these prayers. And so Psalm 25, say it with me, pray with me. Turn yourself to me and have mercy on me, for I am desolate and afflicted. The troubles of my heart have enlarged. Bring me out of my distresses. Look on my affliction and my pain and forgive all my sins. Consider my enemies. For they are many, and they hate me with cruel hatred. Keep my soul and deliver me. Let me not be ashamed, for I put my trust in you. 
Let integrity and uprightness preserve me, for I wait for you. Redeem Israel, O God, out of all their troubles. Amen. Amen. Now let's pray the prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. We are going to do our testimony. And as I told you, we're going to be having testimonies. And we're going to incorporate it. But we have a special testimony uh, from a Jewish gal. And I'll play the clip for a moment. It's like six, maybe four, about five, six minutes long. I'm not sure. But uh, this is a Jewish gal who found Yeshua. And it's a very, very powerful testimony. And so we're going to watch this. You don't need all that. I need it. I need to hear the scriptures and have them meaningful. And they sound so simple. There's nothing simple about them. They're very profound. I had grown up with a great deal of anti-Semitism in my town. Remember, I was a teenager during World War II. So we spent first those two years in an orphanage. And it was a very, very scarring experience. My brother never got over it. I was stronger, so I got over that. But what it did was make me very self-reliant. I never thought I'd go to college. We didn't have any money, but I had to work my way through. And when I got through college, as with my BA, I had a major in psychology and a minor in sociology. And they said, what can you do? I said, I can type. They said, we have a job for you. <laughs> so that's what I did type. But I did end up with really fun jobs. You know, I worked as a guide in NBC and met all the movie stars. I never see anything on the old movies that I haven't met these people in person. So I had a fun job. But it was there's this emptiness absolute emptiness. I said, I'm just making up this thing from day to day instead of living it. And I've always volunteered. I volunteered. I've always been a volunteer, so I felt I was contributing, but it was still empty. And then they were calling for uh, teachers because of the baby boom had come in at that time. And they needed people who had BA degrees, but no education credits. I had friends who had gotten their doctorates, and I'm very competitive, so I said, I, I think I can do that. But I wanted to go to the best college, university I could find, and that was at Teachers College Columbia. I had a student uh, in my, one of my classes wrote a paper. Uh, about virtues and values and so on. And of all the papers I'd ever gotten on that subject, I've taught it many times. This was a remarkable paper. There was something spiritual about it. So I asked to meet with him after class, and we started talking about it. I asked where he got those ideas and what a good writer he was. And he said that he had been in despair also. I told him how that, you know, I was in despair, but that he had found um, Christianity, a relationship with God had made the difference. Now, that's all he said. He didn't preach or anything. He just said it. So I was very interested. I said, do you have anything that would help me? He came to my house and gave me a lot of sermons. He put them on my computer. It was a loving, unselfish, comforting. And I said, I wanted to be part of whatever he was part of. So that's when I asked to come to the church. But it was through that paper and our friendship, and we still have that very solid friendship, I had to find out what he knew. So I thought, at my age, who wants to be with an old lady? And I find this 34-year-old brought me to a whole world 
And not only did he accept me, but introduced me to other people who felt the same way. And the nicest people I ever met were those people who believed that way. And they happened to be uh, Jews and Christians who just treated one another so special. And I couldn't get over that in this material world that there were people like that. It's really the world powerful. breaks everyone. If Christ gave us his glory, how can we ever uh, not feel healed from it? You know, if you're with him, if you trust him, you've got to feel that he's healing you, even though we don't deserve it. You know? It's very personal. He's my friend, and I, and I feel his love, and I feel that he's that he is my strength, and he helps me in my broken places. And I feel that he's always going to be there for me, and uh, I don't get depressed anymore. I feel that this is God's gift of love to me. It's his grace. His grace. Awesome. Awesome. Awesome testimony. One thing I want to point out is we... You know, we've been talking about the power of influence and how this Jewish woman came to faith was simply another man living out his faith. Totally indirectly wrote a paper because his faith was in the Lord. He wrote about him. And it was so powerful. You think about the power of the gospel when you're not even trying. The gospel is so powerful. It impacted her life for all eternity. She's going to see eternity because she read this paper. And he was an awesome testimony to her. And this is how it's got to be. And you see the things of, obviously the spirit was leading the whole thing because he didn't come and beat her over the head with Yeshua. He showed her love. He showed integrity. He showed he, that he cared. He, he was there for her. And she wanted it. See, when we're walking out the faith right, people are going to want it. And that's my point. It will inspire others. They will want to have what we have. But if you're in bondage and you're in addictions and you're dealing with all these issues, they don't need you for that. They, can, they have that right where they're at, right? They don't need us. That's why we need to be a light to the world. We, we need to step out. This, these are the people who we need to be that reach out to be examples to these Jewish people to be lights. It's very, very powerful.